So this is a second video about refraction and why the speed of light seems to change through glass. We've already done one with Professor Merrifield, here's Professor Moriarty. And as I said in the previous video, these have been pretty much left unedited barring a few cuts here and there, so you can just sort of see how the interview unfolded. So two years ago we looked at glass and the question we wanted to address there was why is glass transparent? And um, Brady told me I had less than 10 minutes. So I kept to less than 10 minutes, but in 10 minutes, you can't do a hell of a lot. So what I really wanted to cover was just that basic concept of something called the band gap, and you can go back and watch that video. But since, that, since we uploaded that video, I've had quite a large number of emails, and there were a large number of comments underneath it saying, well, what about higher energy photons? What about gamma rays and x-rays? What about reflection? And in particular, what about refraction? What's going on then? Those photons are going through, and if they haven't got enough energy to get this electron from one energy state to another. Why, why does light refract? Why does it interact at all with the lattice? That's a remarkably, remarkably difficult question to address. And, but we're going to try. And I'm going to try and do it without swamping you with postgraduate level physics. So the idea was, if we go back to um, those, that glass, that the idea of why is glass transparent, is that you have photons. Let me get some coloured balls again and those photons move through the glass and only if they have enough energy to excite an electron from one energy state to another do they really strongly and perhaps I should have said strongly last time strongly interact with the with the glass which means that if they don't do that they can get through the all the way through the glass and come out the other side but of course they don't quite come out the other side entirely unaffected because otherwise we wouldn't have refraction. So what's going on? Well, it's important. We, we can look at this in a number of different ways. One thing to really bear in mind is that, okay, we can model or we can think of photons, packets of light like this. They're obviously not like this, and they have a wave-like character as well. And basically, they're a quantum of the electromagnetic field. What does that mean? Well, what it really means is that the... Um, the, when the photon's passing through the solid, or when very many photons are passing through the solid, because quantum mechanically we really shouldn't talk of just a single photon, but when they're passing through the glass, they have associated with them an electric field that's oscillating back and forth gazillions of times a second. It also has a magnetic field. We don't need to worry about that. And what that electric field can do, if we can now think of this as, maybe we'll think of this as an atom, Oh, you know that you've got atoms in the solid, those atoms have got electrons surrounding them. As the photon goes through, what it does is that electric field associated with the photon starts to get the electrons here to oscillate. And those electrons in turn radiate a photon. So what you have is you have the original wave going through, and then you also have all the other electromagnetic waves due to the electrons that have been oscillating, and they re-radiate. And it's the interaction between those two waves, the original wave and the wave due to all the excitations of the electrons, that give rise to effectively refraction. You can think of it in a number of different ways. Um, one of the, you Google it and you look for answers to this question and you'll see first of all how difficult a question it is. But particularly in the physics forums, there's this idea that what happens is that you're continually exciting electrons and they're continually decaying, you're getting re absorption and re-emission. That's not a good way to think of it um, because what's, it's, it's a very different effect. You can certainly have um, uh, the, the photon being absorbed, but once it's absorbed, then it's, it's given its energy up to get that electron transition to happen. It's dead, effectively, which is what I said in the Wise Glasses Transparent video. The important thing, though, is it doesn't have to be absorbed like that. It can excite these electrons in a much weaker sense. In some way, in some quantum mechanical context, yes, you can think of it as an absorption process, but it has to be distinguished from that fundamental absorption process. And so Feynman does a great job. Where have I put Feynman's lectures in physics? This is just a fantastic description, I think, of what's happening with refraction. If we turn to page 30, sorry, chapter 31, the, what he's basically talking about, notice how he says right at the end, of, our problem is to understand how the apparently 
slower velocity comes about. So the, the, the idea, the other idea that's come up in the context of, of refractive index is that, which is, is quite, well, very misleading, is the idea that between the atoms, the, 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 um, the wave travels with the speed of light, and then it gets to the atom, it's absorbed, and then it's re-emitted, and that gives you a phase shift. That's, no, that is not a good way of thinking about it, unfortunately. It would be nice if things were that simple and that straightforward. It's important because you can think of it from a classical perspective where the light is a wave and it's interacting with tons and tons and tons and tons and gazillions of atoms. Or if you, even if you think of it from the quantum mechanical perspective, the way to do it properly quantum mechanically, and again this is due to Feynman, is you've got to consider every single possible path for that photon or those photons through the system, including the ones where it you know, bounces around all the edges, goes, follows really convoluted paths, and you've got to sum those up. It's called a path integral approach, but you sum those all up. And you get the same result as you might hope that you get classically. So the important thing is it's a collective effect. You can't think of this, the one single photon interacting with the atoms. And even, you know, the idea that you have, sorry, I'm interchanging atoms and photons. So say I've got um, silicon and oxygen atoms. Silicon, isolated silicon and oxygen atoms, which obviously make up glass, have a very different electronic structure than if you put them all together to form glass. The, uh, the idea that it's, you maintain the electronic orbitals, etc., that you have in the bare atoms, particularly for the most loosely bound electrons, is wrong. The important thing is that you get those electrons interact with each other. They form not just single discrete energy levels, they form bands of energy levels. I'm going over the top here, aren't I? When my photons go through the glass, you're now telling me in an indirect way they are able to make the electrons wiggle. Yeah. Surely that means the photon and all the photons have to lose some of their energy to be able to get the electrons doing that. So there is some degree, yeah, there's some degree of energy transfer that has to be um, uh, to, 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 to get this process to, to, to happen, to have that interaction happen. But the important thing is that, let me step back again. So when we're talking about the, all the electrons together in the solid, all the atoms together in the solid, if you oscillate this electron, then all the other surrounding electrons feel that oscillation. So what you have is what it's termed a collective process, or even what we talk about are things called quasi-particles. So this is a, um, where instead of thinking that of that electron just as an individual particle, what you've got to think about is that, in, that electron and the influence of all the surrounding electrons. And it's the interaction of that photon with that quasi-particle that's of importance here, and that will affect the motion of the, the, the photon through the, through the glass. There's a phase shift, there's an effective phase. So basically what's happening is, you know, you've got a wave coming in there. When that wave comes out, so the peaks and troughs are no longer at the same effective position. So you might have a wave that looks, if I can get it right, let's, let me just push it on a little bit. So what you, do, what you have is a, is a phase shift. And so it's that effective, we talk about the phase velocity, you know, where we're looking at, if we pick one of these peaks, how that moves through, the, how that moves with time. The phase velocity is different, um, but the wave is still moving with the speed of light. So it's a phase shift that's the most important aspect of this. And what does a phase shifted piece of light look like compared to the one before? So a phase shifted piece of light is what gives rise to that bending, is what gives rise to that apparent change in speed and gives rise to that bending. The important thing is of course we're talking about photons in glass and those, gla those photons do not have enough energy to excite those electrons. If they do have enough energy then the photons are swallowed up. So it's, it's that's because... The that's the other video. That's the other video, yeah. If you haven't seen it already, there's also an interview with Professor Merrifield where he basically discusses the same thing, but in his style. So if you want to have a look at it, go ahead. I got a little bit nervous there because my dog got up and I was worried it was going to knock the tripod over.